Well, welcome, guys. We're going to spend some time talking about autoimmune disease, what they are, what it is, um, and uh, hopefully you'll learn a lot about thyroiditis, celiac disease, and inflammatory bowel disease, which are the three most common autoimmune diseases that we happen to see. Um, just a list of disclosures. I really have no relevant uh, financial disclosures to talk about. I do get my salary from my day job, though. Um, I am a woman also with Turner syndrome, and I have Hashimoto's thyroiditis as an autoimmune disease. Um, by training, as you heard, my specialty is allergy and immunology. So I'm putting on my immunologist hat, even though my, when I was in clinical practice, most of what I saw was allergy, specifically food allergy, mind you. Um, so these are the current guideline recommendations that we have. And <coughs> hold on. There we go. These are the current guideline recommendations that we have, which, as you've heard, in the last cardiology session may be changing um, shortly. And I wanted to point out a couple of them here. One is that it invokes thyroid function testing um, for women with TS and thyroid function testing here at age 10 as well. So thyroid testing is a routine screening thing for women with TS, and you'll understand the reasons why. Um, there's also celiac testing is a recommended testing for women with um, TS, both at age two to five, and older girls as indicated, meaning if you've had the screening at age two to five and then something happens as you're growing up and there's a reason to get retested again, it's appropriate to retest again. So how come the guidelines recommendation these screen, uh, recommend these screenings? Why? Why are they on there? And this is actually the, ra the rationale. So when you think about women with TS, 4 to 40 percent of us have some thyroiditis or some thyroid disease. 2 to 8 percent of us have celiac disease. And 2.6 to 3 percent of us have some inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. This is slightly higher than the general population, which is why they recommend that we get screened for at least the thyroid disease and the celiac disease um, routinely. There are reports of other autoimmune disease, but they're variable. Yes? I just wonder, is Crohn's disease also hereditary? There is, there, there can be a predisposition, right. familial predisposition. Right. Um, and there's a familial predisposition for um, for all autoimmune diseases anyways. Okay. They run in oh, families. Okay. So that's, that's part of it. And would arthritis count as the, uh, around the other? Now that depends because osteoarthritis, which is just overuse arthritis, is not. But rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune. We don't have any data currently that arthritis that are autoimmune are more frequent in women with TS. We don't have the data. We don't have. I, did, I was diagnosed with JRA. Do we? Day. Yeah, but we, we don't have that data. Um, and what you'll see as we go through is there might be a predisposition in general to autoimmunity. This is looking at just in general autoimmune antibodies in women with Turner syndrome. So over here, percentage of Turner syndrome patients, and down here is a um, cross-sectional, that means they just took one group and they looked across their ages. They didn't follow them through the ages, they just looked at the ages. And you can see that as these, as you looked at the older and older women, more percentage of them had autoantibodies. So well, that's one evidence that we have a predisposition to autoimmunity. So what is autoimmunity then? What, what is it? Um, so this is the WebMD definition of autoimmunity. We have to understand what something is before we can talk about it. So autoimmunity is a condition where one's own tissues are subject to the deleterious effects of the immune system. 
So basically what this means is your immune system should not attack itself. It should be educated enough to know. And this is one of the things that your cells do, your immune system cells. They're like immigration people. Your immune cells constantly every day are wandering up to a cell and saying, do you belong to me? Do you belong here? Do you belong here? Show me your passport. And the passport is actually the proteins on the outside of the cells. They have to have proteins on the outside of the cells that identify them as self, as self. <coughs> and if they have those, the cell goes, OK, I'm moving on to the next one. And the reason for this is every day, you and I are creating cancer cells, and you and I are exposed to foreign things such as pathogens. So you want your immune system taking survey of all your cells and saying, you're a good cell, you're a good cell. Oh, you're not a good cell. You're, you're done for, I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> Basically, that's what happens. That's how your immune system works. At least the cellular immune system, which is what we're gonna be talking about, not the allergy system that makes you sneeze or have immediate food allergy. We're not talking about that immune system, we're talking about the cellular system and how it functions. So that's what autoimmunity is. You have lost that education. That immune cell cannot any longer ignore a cell that is self. You've let a clone of your immune cell loose that thinks that particular tissue is no longer a good tissue. And it will depend on where that tissue is as to what disease it's going to be. You can imagine if you lose tolerance to your thyroid tissue and start destroying your thyroid, it affects and causes Hashimoto's, right? If it causes GI issues, if you've lost tolerance to the GI tissues, it'll cause issues in your GI system. So we've talked a little bit about this already. I wanted to go over the immune boot camp. So I already mentioned that immune cells prevent infections. You already heard me say that immune cells ensure that cells are self. You gotta have a cell in your immune system making sure every cell belongs to you and not to someone else. So they also ensure that all T and B cells are useful and not deleterious. So there are actually cells in the body who go to the other T cells and say, hmm, are you a good T cell or are you a bad T cell? There's actually cells that do that. And if they find a T cell that has poor, and we call it recognition. So if a T cell finds another T cell has recognition for self cells, that's the, hopefully the immune system will use its tools to make that cell not harm you. When things go wrong though, that's what causes autoimmune cell. And I also told you that the last thing the immune, cell do, the immune system does is ensure the removal of cancerous cells. Any questions basically about the immune boot camp before we move on? It's important to understand. Once you have a problem with your immune system, such as Crohn's, You're talking about, are you going to get more infections? What I'm talking about is, can your body or will your, is your body more at risk of attacking another part of your body? Yes. Once you've lost the education, you're more prone to losing the education. Yeah. You've, already go, you've already made that leap. It already went crazy once, it can go crazy in two again. Mm hmm. My thought it was this diamond with Hashimoto's. Sure. I have Hashimoto's. Sure. That's not uh, osteo. So your question is, what can you expect for your daughter? We'll talk about Hashimoto's disease, but most of the time, Hashimoto's disease is not associated with arthritis. Mm, okay. See, I had read an article, but I guess it was not. A, not a hundred percent. Yeah. And if it's osteoarthritis, like you mentioned, yeah. that's more related to overuse. Yeah. 
than it is to an autoimmune disorder. And that's extremely common in the population as we're all aging. We do that. Yeah. Well, I mean, with any autoimmune disease, it can get worse and better and worse and better. Yeah. The ultimate, we'll, we'll talk about Hashimoto's, but the ultimate thing is you lose function of your thyroid, and that's that. Once the thyroid tissue is destroyed, there's no more flare-ups. There isn't any more to trigger it, and you're done. And luckily, Hashimoto's disease is really easy in the fact that replacing the thyroid hormone replaces the function of the tissue, and there's nothing else to be done. So we'll talk about Hashimoto's in specifically um, in just a second. You also have two systems, the innate immune system um, and the adaptive immune system. This is important because the innate immune system is a basic one. It's based on pattern recognition, on preser it's preserved evolutionarily. Even bugs have an innate immune system. Basically, this is the most basic level and it looks for uh, pathogens, bacteria, viruses, and immediately gets rid of them. The majority of uh, bacteria and viruses you're exposed to are treated with this system. Um, there's the adaptive immune system, which is based on response to specific organisms or systems. It's more advanced. It's also split into humoral or blood-related and cellular. So we've talked a little bit about the cellular, which is I was describing to you what happens. The cells go into the tissue and take survey of them. And if they don't find what they're expecting, they cause a response. Usually it's killing that cell that's not self or not a good cell. So would, would um, like tumor infiltrating lymphocytes be adaptive? Right? Uh, well, that's a tumor adapting to the immune system and hiding. Adaptive immune system is when you get chicken pox. You make chicken pox antibodies. Oh, okay. Oh. I just know my, my husband had cancer, and they said he had what, what helped his cancer is that he had a bunch of cells that were like tumors that were He developed specific cells that recognize that specific tumor that is specific antibody. So specifically recognizing a specific protein, a specific cell, a specific tissue, that's adaptive immune system. So the, cell, the humoral or blood-based um, immune system is immunoglobulins. So as I was mentioning, if you have chickenpox, you make chickenpox antibodies, and guess what? You're protected about chickenpox. No surprise there, right? So what it is, an immunoglobulin is a large Y-shaped protein, just down here, and it identifies and gets rid of foreign objects, like bacteria and viruses. That's the most common thing you think of. The specificity is up here on the top. That is what makes that anybody recognize chickenpox. Or, in our case as we're going along, one of the things, perhaps, thyroid tissue, okay? Or perhaps, in a roundabout way, um, other antiproteins that are associated with autoimmunity. Um, cellular can be made up of a bunch of different cells. Each cell is unique. You have a ton of proteins your bodies recognize, but each cell is responsible for recognizing one. Each antibody is responsible for recognizing one. This is what it looks like. It's a little complicated, but here's what we talked about as far as um, T cells. They come from the bone marrow to the thymus, and that's a T cell lymphocyte. This is the quintessential part of the cellular immune system. And you've heard me mention them already once, right? Or several times as we're talking about those cells that take surveys of the tissue to make sure that they're not something you don't want in your body. This over here is what's called the B lymphocyte 
from the bone marrow, and it is the one that ultimately makes antibodies. Those are the two things we're going to be talking about because we're going to use the antibodies in our discussion of autoimmunity. So I needed you to understand what they are. They're little factors your cells secrete that actually recognize epitopes also and have a function in your immune system. And you have these cells that do the same thing. They specifically recognize a protein in your body. So here's our first autoimmunity, which is autoimmune thyroiditis, which we've already had a question about. And this is basically your thyroid. Your thyroid is right here. It sits in your neck kind of has that winged sort of look right there. And that's a nice, normal thyroid. What does a thyroid do? Well, it does a lot of things, actually. Uh, it makes your metabolism go. So it's responsible for um, your metabolism. It's responsible for your growth. It can regulate long, bro long bone growth. It can actually regulate your alertness, too. It, it affects your neurons in your brain and can affect alertness. And actually, it affects a lot of your bone, your, a lot of your cells in your system. People kind of think of this as like the furnace, kind of like the, the go kind of a thing. And the classic thing most of you have already heard is thyroid causes weight gain. That's probably what every one of you, how many, room, how many have heard of that? OK. So that's only one of the things that it does. Um, it does a lot of other things. So it's an important hormone to have. It's critical. There are actually two types of autoimmune disease with the thyroid. And they're very, very, very different. Autoimmune hypothyroidism, also known as Hashimoto's. This is what's common in TS. Hashimoto's is known by most people as low thyroid. I've already described what happens. Ultimately, the thyroid is supposed to be protected and kept from the immune system so it's not destroyed. Somehow, in Hashimoto's, and we'll talk about this in a second, it's been exposed. And the immune system has decided, that tissue doesn't belong to me. I'm going to get rid of it. It's a danger to me. It's wrong, of course, right? That's your thyroid tissue. But it doesn't know the difference. It's convinced that that tissue is foreign. And its job is to get rid of it. So it will. And once the thyroid tissue is gone, you have no thyroid to function. And that's what Hashimoto's or low thyroid, um, low thyroid is in actuality. The other is very different. It's called hyperthyroidism or high thyroid. This is called Graves' disease. And instead of turning the thyroid off, your body has developed antibodies that basically tell the thyroid, go, 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 produce thyroid hormone, produce thyroid hormone. And your body can't shut it off because your immune system is producing those antibodies. We are not talking about that because we are not at increased risk for that. It's completely different. This one is related to the cells destroying the thyroid, although there are antibodies involved. This one is related to the development of an antibody that drives the thyroid to function when it should stop. This is what, if you took out a thyroid from somebody with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, that is the lumpy, bumpy thyroid that you would see. This mess is what a thyroid with Hashimoto's looks like. And I want you to look at this. Do you see the kind of blue here? Do you see that? They're all over there. And do you see how these are nice and round? But do you see the blue creeping over here? Uh-huh. What do you think is going on there? What are the blue cells, knowing what I told you? What are those little blue dots? Huh? The cells. Somebody said it. Those are the blue cells. Those are the cells. You see them in person. What are they doing over here? 
the tissue should look like this, nice and organized. What are they doing over there? What do they do to it? They're destroying it. They're making it look like mush. It can't function. Now you know what I was talking about. Now you see what I'm saying. This is what's required for a normal functioning thyroid. That's what you have. What do you see in real life? This is a long list of symptoms. Tiredness, well, we knew about that. Dis depression, some people can have depression, and that's the neuronal alertness we were talking about. Modest weight gain, please notice modest weight gain. This is a plea from my endocrinologist friend. <laughs> cold intolerance, some people will feel cold when they're not. Excessive sleepiness, that neuronal alertness again. Coarse dry hair, uh, constipation, dry skin, muscle cramps, increased cholesterol levels from that metabolism not being driven properly, decreased concentration, the neuronal alertness, vague aches and pains and swelling of the legs. Now most of us have had some of these, right, from time to time. Not all of us will have had thyroid disease, so that tells you it's hard to detect it just by talking to you, right? Okay, and not all of these symptoms are related to thyroid disease, so don't go home every one of you and think, I've been tired. <laughs> you know. Um, but here's what we're talking about. The prevalence of autoantibodies in TS by karyotype. And this is looking at thyroid antibodies. And you know there's multiple karyotypes of Turner syndrome. How many of you have heard of isochrome X? I have one too. Who's, who's that? Raise your hand. Woohoo! All right. Um, Y'all are familiar with 45X. Isochrome X, for those of you who don't know, are those of us who have two Xs. But instead of having a short arm and a long arm, we have two long arms. It's the same deal because we're missing the information on the short arm, so we're still TS because we don't have that information. We just have two of the long arm. Can I ask you a question about that? Mm. So my daughter has part of that, and then sometimes she just has one X. Is that then considered I think? Probably two cell lines, one cell line with one X and nothing, and one cell line X and with isochrome? Isoprom. Yeah, the good thing about TS is it really doesn't matter what your karyotype is. There's very little association between karyotype and outcomes, except for in a few things. This is one of them. Would, so would she be considered an isochrome or an other? Probably depends on how much of her cell line is isochrome and how much of her cell line is... is isochrome. Yeah, so maybe. She might be. It depends on the dose, right? If you have the majority of your cell lines isochrome, you're probably going to have an increased risk. If it's only a tiny percent, it's probably not. Okay. So it depends. Yeah. Um, when I was with the NIH, um, I actually, Dr. Bondi said that she had found an even higher incidence in diabetes. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. We have autoimmune stuff going on. Um, so this tells you that those of us with isochrome, there's something going on with that extra X that causes us to be predisposed to autoimmune disease, which kind of makes sense because if you look at the population, women in general, even those without TS are the ones that get autoimmune disease and perhaps the locus that causes or predisposes to autoimmune disease is on that long arm. We don't know, we just know that this is true. And this is just uh, telling you the frequency of which one, and you can see those of us with isochrome. We're not the most common, but we're not the least common either. Um, this is actually looking again at the progression. So what percent of patients who end up beginning to have those antibodies to thyroid disease actually end up with the destruction that we saw on the biopsy? And you can see that those are positive, I don't think I need to tell you that as time goes up, you can see the increase in patients who have actual Hashimoto's thyroiditis. They, they have destruction of their thyroid. And you can see within 15 years, almost 60% of the people who had antibodies 
will end up with needing treatment and having Hashimoto's. Once your thyroid is destroyed and it's been determined it's been destroyed, does it, then it is necessary to be removed? Removed? There is a higher prevalence of malignancy, but usually they use monitoring instead of just removing it in general. Usually. Yeah. Yes, it, the, as I mentioned, there's a higher prevalence of it, but usually doctors, most of the time, will, will tend to monitor it clinically to, to do it that way. Could you explain a little bit the difference between regular hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's? Um, actually, there, Hashimoto's is the most common version of hypothyroidism. It just means low thyroid function. There is a whole separate kettle of fish called congenital where babies are born without good functioning thyroid. And then there's a whole separate slew of other causes. But the most common cause when somebody says they have hypothyroidism is this, the majority of the time. How is your body affected when the thyroid is moved and you, you, you're only taking Synthroid? It's like you still have your thyroid working. That's the beauty of hypothyroidism. You just take the thyroid hormone and it, you, you've replaced it completely. Oh, you can be. You can be. Um, you still have that propensity to have it. Um, thyroid disease, the predisposition to other autoimmunities. You do. Um, as the thyroid, thyroid tissue gets added, increases, mm -hmm. does that mean your thyroid medication is increased according to your blood test? Well, you need to monitor it to make sure you're adequately repleted. Will that change over time? It really depends on where you got diagnosed. A lot of people get diagnosed really late. So if your thyroid is completely destroyed before you get diagnosed, you're going to be put on the one dose and stay there. So it depends. And there's many reasons for that. So Hashimoto's is a biopsy-based diagnosis. So, so it can't, it, it wouldn't be diagnosed by a blood work. Yes and no. Can you know that somebody has the antibodies and assume that the reason their thyroid is not functioning are related to those antibodies? Of course you can. Can you see the changes on the pathology? No. Does that make sense? thyroid problems because my daughter with TS, I, I have a hypo, my sister has Graves' disease, and so at her eight-week appointment, she was diagnosed with hypothyroidism, and mm -hmm. I knew when she was four weeks old, she was sleeping 20 hours a day, and while babies are supposed to sleep, I was like, I think she already has hypothyroidism, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so does it matter, and treatment why? No, it's the same. It's, it's just the difference. It's thyroid just hormone. The difference it's it thyroid hormone. It. Mm -hmm. okay. That's the one thing that's, you know, when, when you talk about people about hypothyroidism, the good news about it is we have the bioidentical hormone. Right, right. So as long as we're taking it every day but and it replacing it. It doesn't mean that you're at higher risk for anything else depending on when you're diagnosed. You do have a higher propensity of having other autoimmune diseases. Right, but yeah. other than that. No, mm-mm. So the testing that somebody can do for thyroid disease to screen is a free T4. Free T4 is that good thyroid hormone that goes to your cells and does all the wonderful things that thyroid hormone does. That's also what you take. That's why it's bioidentical. That means it's exactly the same hormone that you're given when you can't make it. Thyroid stimulating hormone is the hormone that actually comes higher up in the, in the pathway. It comes from the pituitary, and it goes to the thyroid and says, thyroid, make T4. So if it's elevated, the thyroid isn't working as well, right? It's kind of counterintuitive a little bit, but think about it. So if your thyroid's sluggish and the TSH is the hormone that's responsible for kicking the thyroid in the butt and making it work, if it's high, 
That means the thyroid is sluggish and not working. If it's low, what do you think it means? Huh? Overworking. Slow down. You don't need so much. So would you see, just this is totally, just want to make sure I'm teaching right. So in Graves' disease, where it's overactive, do you think the TSH would be high or low? Are you listening? Which way? High ends up for high, hands up, hands up for low. Cool. Y'all listen. It was low. But not everybody raised their hands. Come on now. <laughs> My teaching thing on, is on the line here. Come on now. <laughs> Antithyroglobulin binding antibody or an antithyroperoxidase antibodies are two autoantibodies made when your body has lost tolerance to your thyroid. That's a marker. That's hands up that the immune system has seen the thyroid and it doesn't like it. That means that the cells are going to be involved shortly after as well. So it's kind of an early warning system. You saw the, the slide that I showed the progression to Hashimoto's disease. The thyroid antibodies came up and then we followed those patients and 60% of them after time when they got the antibodies had actual disease of the thyroid. So those are the tests that you can do to kind of look at the blood to determine what's going on at the thyroid. Now, will that show as an auto, will that show as your immune system being elevated? You know, it's kind of hard to answer that question because immune systems, it's either educated or not. You can think of having autoantibodies, you might want to say, as being overactive. I think it's better to think of them as being properly or not properly educated. Because in autoimmune diseases, the immune system is now poorly educated and poorly regulated. And that's one sign that the uh, immune system is being poorly educated and regulated. Okay, but the thyroid is done. It's done. Mm -hmm. You know, thyroid medicine. Mm -hmm. During the time that it's trying to kick the thyroid out, yeah, mm -hmm. you'll see them. You shouldn't have any, any in the first place. It's abnormal to have them. That's not normal, remember? Because they're there, they've lost the ability to regulate. They shouldn't be there in the first place. The immune system shouldn't see the thyroid. It should be protected. It should know not to go there. But it's lost, it's broken down. It's miseducated, it's misregulated. So any level of those antibodies? It's abnormal. It's yeah. abnormal. Any level of detecting those is where you get to that 60 percent, 15 years. Over time. Yeah. Not, and remember, that's 60 percent, not, not 100. Yeah. So some people, for some reason, and we don't understand them, that 40 percent is still there. Either they haven't gotten there yet, or for some reason they can have antibodies, but the immune system doesn't seem to play the same way it does in the rest. And in those cases, my shoulders will go up and I'll go, I have no idea. I'm happy, but I can't explain it. So luckily, we've already talked about this. This is the treatment for thyroid disease, and it's thyroid hormone. And your endocrinologist will also follow your levels to make sure that it's neither too high nor too low, because you don't have your pituitary is not able to do that for you anymore. Remember the helpful TSH? Your body used to do that for you. Can a pill do it? Nope. So now for the rest of your life, you're going to have to have somebody checking your blood in order to be able to make sure you're neither taking too much nor too little. Are you ready to move on to the next one now that you've mastered thyroid disease? If you ask me, and if you ask most of my endocrinology friends, they'll say the brand name Synthroid actually is more easy to regulate. But usually it's uh, levothyroxine is the generic name. And that's perfectly acceptable too, to use. I just had a really important question. So I have uh, mm -hmm. Right. Versus uh, biopsy. Sure. Um, 
So you had an ultrasound that was consistent with Hashimoto's. They knew I was low. And you had the and you had the antibodies. Right. Common sense would, I mean, I'm not sure, to be honest. Oh that would be a better okay. doctor. I mean, common sense says either that that would be another alternative that you still needed to be regulated. Okay. But also, you know, it's not on her. It, it wouldn't be, it would be a better conversation with your physician to talk about it because it's hard to know of the individual case. I was just curious because you were saying the Hashimoto's slow. In general. Hashimoto's and I also in, in general. In general. Mm -hmm. Ready for celiac? All right. So celiac disease is different. Why does it go down to the beginning? Hmm. I may be. I may have. See, it timed out as I was answering questions. I can't hear you. Well, you know, the, 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 the guidelines which I showed at the very first slide say once in the beginning and then after age 10. I don't see that they have a kind of a, a frequency um, that I noticed on there. Um, so now we're going to move on to the stomach and intestines. Um, and, you know, the symptoms that you see in celiac disease are here on this table in the frequencies. And you can see that the most common thing people have is diarrhea or fatigue. Borborygmi is a very fancy word for those stomach growls. You know what I'm talking about? We can't just say stomach growls. We say borborygmi. So 35 to 72% general pain, weight loss, abdominal distension, and flatulence. Here are some lower ones showing here that there's some malnutrition when you have celiac disease. You can have some liver function issues or vomiting. You can have iron deficiency due to the malnutrition and uh, you can have some neurologic dysfunction or constipation, so either diarrhea, but sometimes constipation and nausea. These are kind of nondescript symptoms, right? How many of you have had these things? <laughs> How many think ha all of you have celiac? No, you, you may. So it's kind of nondescript also. So what is celiac disease? And here we have to invoke our um, immune system again. Do you see over here, right over here, can you see how the intestines, when you take an intestine, slice it and look under the microscope, it, ha it has these fingers. You see that? These are to increase surface area of your intestine to allow for absorption. That's normal. That's what it should happen. You see these blue dots? See that? What's happened to the fingers? Where'd they go? They went away. OK. Please remember that those fingers are important in absorption. That's important. That's what celiac disease is. It's a malabsorption. You can't absorb your food properly because of the disease. What happens basically is because of the wheat allergen, the cells are triggered. They're told to go to the immune system, to go to the gut, and actually literally destroy the gut. Just like it destroyed the thyrus, the thymus, right now, the thyroid, right now in celiac disease, if someone with celiac disease eats wheat, their miseducated immune system will tell those cells, hey, go to that intestine and destroy the gut lining. Should it do that? Again, it's a miseducated response to a protein that should be harmless. Again, the immune system is not ex ignoring a signal that it should, which makes it an immune, autoimmune system. And it's attacking itself. 
Um, this is the complicated explanation that I just gave you. In the byproduct, the immune system will also interact with B cells and have the B cells create these autoantibodies. And that is something that we can draw in the lab. That's kind of an aside addition of what happens in the immune response to eating wheat when it's lost its tolerance to wheat. Now this cellular involvement and effect of the immune, of the GI tract is completely different to those who have a food allergy, which is properly called anaphylaxis to wheat. Completely different, completely. And those antibodies are not the same antibodies that they look for in a wheat allergy. They're different. We'll talk about that in a minute. So if you were to look at a normal intestine, do you see how nice this looks, healthy pink tissue? Can you see those fingers that I'm talking about? Look down here. Is that kind of pale and white? Kind of pale. Do you see how it has these dots? Can you imagine those being the fingers and that's healthy tissue? And look over here. Where's my fingers? They're gone. They're gone. Okay. And, you know, if you really get a good tissue sample, you may see some of those th uh, blue dots, those T cells in there too. So what is the risk for celiac disease? Specifically, for women with Turner, oh, and it didn't, how come, see, this is what happens when you do things on a Mac and you try to do it on the Windows, on, on, a, on a Windows computer. So that should be around the Turner syndrome. So the prevalence of celiac disease among those with that risk factor, which is Turner's, is two to 10%. So it's not a large percent of the population that have celiac, but it's higher than the general population. Um, so how do you detect celiac disease? There's actually really two ways. One is the antibody, and the one is the EGD and uh, biopsy, and that's esophageal gastroduodenoscopy. So the antibodies that we can look for, remember we saw those in that busy slide down the bottom? That's called anti-IgA tissue transglutamidase. We just say TTG. You don't want to say that whole word. So we say TTG. You can also look for IgA to endo endomesial antibodies. TTG is what most people use currently, the IgA to TTG. Um, still, to this day, EGD and biopsy is the conclusive gold standard way to prove that you have celiac disease. And what you see is that loss of the villi, or the fingers, that's what it is. And you can almost see those little blue dots pretty well in this, in this slide. Unfortunately, even today, because we can't re-educate the immune system, it would be great if I had a tool to go up to that clone of cells and say, dude, you don't belong here, I don't like you, go away, go to sleep. But I can't do that. We don't have any way to communicate with the immune system to that degree and level. What we can do is either replace what's missing because of the immune response, like in Hashimoto's, or we can remove the trigger we can do that. So the trigger in this case is the wheat. So our key method of treatment is avoidance at this point. So do, if you do avoid, do the villi grow back? They regrow. The one of the most, one of the most uh, tissues that proliferate the most or that can reheal itself, the GI tract is one of those that are highly replicated and can, re and can replace itself. I know. Uh huh? What about wheat makes this happen? Yeah, that's a good question. We have a lot of theories, but we know it's one of the proteins on the wheat that actually trigger the trigger the the cells to go into the GI tract. Um, we we can talk about the 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 factors that traffic the cells there. We can talk about the adherence molecules. We can talk about all of those molecules, but the exact why is something we can't get at with science. 
So I can tell you all the immune factors that are involved. I can tell you the genetic epitopes that are involved, but we can't exactly get at exactly why the wheat does this. We can describe what happens because the wheat is doing it. Um, this is actually continued treatment. Um, these are things that are felt to always avoid when you have a wheat allergy. It's actually quite challenging, as my friend with celiac will tell you. Um, and these are avo avoid unless labeled gluten-free. So these are things that you have to be careful with, especially oats or oatmeal is, is one of the classic things that people actually purchase um, that they have to be careful for. You want to look for steel-cut oats. But sometimes these can be contaminated. These are flowers and grains that are allowed when you have celiac disease. Um, rice tends to be quite frequently used in the gluten-free products as a replacer. Sure, there's lots of lists and, and you know. You don't have one here other than that. You mean one to hand to you? No, but I, I can refer you to certain websites that'll, that'll be able to tell you that. Um, it's, there's lots of literature about how to do a gluten-free diet, um, and it can't even be done without purchasing the more expensive gluten-free products. <coughs> you don't have to go do that. Okay. Have had that already for you. But we can get you that information I easy. Other issues, and I'm not a DS, so oh. it's just making sense now. Um, and gluten avoidance continues. These are some things that people have gotten into trouble that may contain some gluten. Certain toothpaste, Play-Doh, Play some medication and vitamins, you may want to check into that. Um, and again, food additives. The, the favorite thing that's hard is if they just do modified food starch because they don't have to disclose it. That's a very complicated thing. They're not required to disclose what that is. Um, so that's, that's celiac disease in a nutshell. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, if I, was, I had um, the antibodies and EGD done, and they said I was fine, nothing's mm -hmm. wrong. Is it possible in the future to develop antibodies? Of course. You can develop an autoimmune disease at any time in your life, and an allergy for that matter, at any time in your life. People always ask me, well, I've been eating it all the time before. And I always tell them, well, the immune system can become dysregulated at any time. It's like a light switch. Thank you. If the light switch gets turned on, does it matter how long the, dark, the room was dark beforehand? Is there any relationship there? No, of course not. The light is on now. It's always good to have. Oh no, you're fine. It's always good to have an open communication, and not everybody that has trouble with digestion or it's has celiac tough. disease. Right. Um, and my word of advice, just personally speaking, is I would want to have a good, clear understanding of, of that I had celiac disease before I embarked on a gluten-free diet. Mm -hmm. I would. Um, the principal piece. I was questioning that the play-doh. Is that, would they have to eat it to be? Uh, sometimes a small re residue on the hands because they're constantly going to their mouth yeah, too. Yeah. And some people are so sensitive to small amounts that that might be enough to cause them to have some um, issues with pain or some issues with their stomach. Um, so this is the, yes? So on the, um, the indicator with the antibodies, mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, indeterminate and then um, highly suspicious. Yep. Mm -hmm. so that's basically how they read it. Is there a level that's normal, I guess, is one of my questions. And then is there a similar stat on, like, you get into that gray zone, what's the percentage at which you're probably going to get it at some point? When you're talking about a, a determination of, of celiac disease by blood work, there is a cutoff level that they have. Of course, having antibodies, just like for Hashimoto's, is not, in, is not 
proof positive that you're going to have the celiac disease, which is why I would encourage anyone who does have the antibodies to follow up with taking a biopsy. Of course, I'm not a GI doctor. You have to clear that with your GI. But my own personal, this is personal philosophy, would be that I would want confirmation at the tissue level that what they suspect that's going on in the antibodies is actually going on before I committed myself and somebody else to, um, to a gluten-free diet. And let us quickly do inflammatory bowel disease. And I'm going to ask you if you guys would wait afterwards. I'd be happy to answer questions, but in essence of time, we need to proceed quickly so that you can get to your next one. So inflammatory bowel disease is an autoimmune disease of the GI tract again. Now we're destroying the GI tract. In Crohn's disease, this GI tract can affect, this autoimmune disease can affect the GI tract from the mouth to the bottom. In ulcerative colitis, it can affect just the colon. It's restricted to the colon. So we're talking about the cells destroying tissue from the mouth to the bottom or just the colon. And there are two separate conditions. One is Crohn's and one is ulcerative colitis. They're both called inflammatory bowel disease. That was quick. Um, how do they look? So this is the appearance of somebody with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. They look similar. This is in the colon. This is, again, you see that high level of those blue dots all over here? And this is how it looks. It should look like healthy tissue, but it doesn't. It looks sick, right? It doesn't look healthy and pink like your mouth does. Um, so what are the signs and symptoms? Um, you can see that they have a lot in common. Diarrhea, abdominal pain, blood in your stool, reduced appetite, weight loss. You can see that there's uh, fevers, some skin rashes with the Crohn's disease, and with the ulcerative colitis. You can have some um, eye problems, inflammation, liver disease. These are the ones that really separate out the two. Um, ulcers in the mouth and the intestines, the fatigue, and the delayed growth or sexual development because Crohn's system affects the entire immune system can have some um, malnutrition as well. So the evaluation of inflammatory bowel disease can be wide. Um, usually they'll want some imaging looking at the abdominal x-rays, the CT scans, and MRI to look at the soft tissue but also the upper GI and a barium enema can be helpful to see those gross changes on the um, tissue. Other things that they might get are certain stool studies. They can look to see if you're bleeding and have lost some red blood cells with the CBC. They can look at these two markers, which are a marker of just inflammation. Remember, this is inflammation from the immune system. This is all, these two are always generated when any inflammation is present. We can't tell where it's from, but we know that it's there by the fact that those two are elevated. Um, the Prometheus panel is also another specific antibody panel developed of antibodies known to be associated with inflammatory bowel disease. And again, as you saw with the celiac, it's only as good as it is. Right? We have cutoffs that we can use to develop what's normal and not normal. So that can really help. Again, the EGD colonoscopy with a biopsy often helps us really determine if the tissues are being affected. Um, putting the whole picture together in inflammatory bowel disease is what helps your provider determine if you have it or not. How do we treat it? This is a lot more complicated than the other diseases that we took. And why? Because you need your GI tract, right? You don't have a specific trigger. That was the saving grace of celiac disease, right? You took the trigger out, the immune system won't destroy it no more, right? In ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, it's more complicated because like, we don't know the trigger. We just know the immune system's attacking it. 
So here, I like to say we have to use elephant guns. We have to inhibit the immune system. We don't have a choice because I can't educate it to tell it don't do that. So I have to dampen it. I have to inhibit it. I have to cripple it in order to allow it to tolerate the GI tract. So here is where we bring out what we call medications that inhibit the immune systems. Things like amino salicylates, corticosteroids is usually one that's commonly started, prednisone, prednisolone, any of those you might have heard. These are other more uh, uh, targeted immune system inhibitors, azathioprine, 6 mercaptopurine, -mer cyclosporin, and the new guys on the block, which are the biologics. And the new guys on the blocks with the biologics, using the antibodies to inhibit the pathways that cause inflammation. And a TNF is anti-inflammatory anti um, and really inhibits the cell's ability to cause inflammation and destruction. Does that make sense why you would want to use it? But uh, We've gotten clever enough to know the inflammation pathway and how to inhibit it in a little more regulated way. And that's what that anti-TNF does. Um, this is another option for patients with ulcerative colitis, kind of a radical one. Do you remember what I said? The trigger for ulcerative colitis was the colon. It's the trigger. If I take it out, what happens? Kind of a radical solution, but it's a solution. So if you can't use the medicines to inhibit the immune system to do it, that's an option for the treatment. Um, in addition to the fact that inflammatory bowel disease carries an increased risk of cancer as well, like some of the other ones. So autoimmune diseases are common among women with Turner syndrome, especially if they have isochromax like me. Um, the prevalence does increase with age. And screening should be conducted as per the guidelines and according to your symptoms as well. And we're done. <laughs>